He's doing all the things Josie tells me to do. Um, okay. Welcome and thank you for coming. I'm sorry that we're crooked. Make ourselves look worse. Just a little. Okay. We're excited to be welcoming um, Kathy Reagan Dalzell and Catherine Nero to Clay and Conversations today. So thanks to everybody who is joining us in person and on Zoom. I am Jennifer Swilling, Curator and Director of Artistic Programs here at the Play Studio. We are thrilled that we can offer these programs for free a few times a month. And if you feel that you would like to support our ability to continue to do these for free, please go over to our website and um, click the support button and you can uh, make a contribution to our exhibition fund. That would be much appreciated. We are all just back from Encica, many of us, um, including Catherine. So we're a little tired, but happy. Um, and happy to be back with our uh, play community here. We want to recognize that the play studio stands on the indigenous territory known as Lenape Hawking, the traditional homelands of the Lenny Lenape people. We would like to take a moment to reflect on the role of the Lenape as the past, present, and future stewards of the land and the role that all of us play in um, joining their tradition of respect and caring for the land and for each other. So we are gonna introduce Kathy Reagan Dalzell and Catherine Narrow. I'll start with Kathy. Kathy is one of the five founders of Clay Studio. She earned her BA from the University of Pennsylvania and studied ceramics at um, PCA, Pennsylvania College of Arts, which is now University of the Arts, Moore College of Art and Penland School of Crafts in North Carolina. Kathy has served on the Clay Studio board over often over the years. She has taught for over 25 years at area schools and has had solo and group exhibitions throughout the Philadelphia region. And you just taught a workshop recently, I think. At a, a memory, the memory center. The memory center. Yeah, because that's great. You're still teaching. Catherine Narrow was born in Philadelphia, but left for Korea at 10 months old, where she lived for three years. She followed this by years in Washington State, Idaho, and then two years in Japan. Catherine believes these formative years living with and among potters and pottery became a strong influence in her life. Perhaps her first trip even foretold her eventual career. She studied ceramics formally with Bill Daly and Petra Spaskies at the Philadelphia College of Art. Following graduation, she became a production potter for 15 years, taught at several colleges and art centers, and then became an arts administrator at the Clay Studio. Retirement has brought Catherine full circle to, be, to being a full-time potter again. She's currently um, an associate artist in the, at the Clay Studio. So thank you both for joining us. I start with Kathy and ask you the question, which is how and why did you make the brave decision to make your life in art? Well, I've thought about this, you know, a lot because I'm trying to figure out what I was going to say. Um, and I think that I didn't really have any art, any any interest in art, or know anything about art uh, in my formative years, I guess. Uh, but when my mother died, I moved in with my aunt and uncle. And um, my aunt was really interested in art and she worked, I grew up in Buffalo, there was an art gallery, she was involved in the art gallery there. And um, she had art around the house. Um, she took artists, young artists under her wing and tried to further their, she tried to sell their work to her friends and it was important, you know. Her daughter, there were three children in that family and the youngest was a daughter. Uh, Marcy, who is six years younger than I am, and she was the artist, and, and that's clearly, she was a wonderful artist. However, she ended up raising horses on top of a mountaintop in Vermont, which is not a bad life. Raising what? Horses. And horses. He, she's a horse whisperer. Oh my gosh. Actually, literally a horse whisperer. Um, and so she, she, we were laughing about this recently. It's like, is it? She's the one who was the artist, and I ended up like not being Anyway, so I guess, and I still look at my tax return and it says artist, and I keep thinking it should say potter. <laughs> you know, I have this little insecurity about that, but um, 
Yes, so that was, I guess, the beginning of it made me, it started, I started looking at it differently. And then um, I think the real switch, the real important part was when I took the class at PCA. Didn't know why, I don't know. I was trying to think why I took that class, but I don't know. I just took a class at PCA. And I'll tell you, and I'm not the first, everybody says this, it just grabs you. And that was, that was it. Um, one of the, one of the things that I think I may have said in the last time I did this was a, uh, Pet Petrus Vasquez was a teacher and what the rule was you couldn't make ashtrays. <laughs> and so, of course, this was 1976. I don't know what it was. I was probably smoking. And um, anyway, you couldn't make, but you couldn't help but make ashtrays because everything was sort of low and flat. <laughs> so without knowing anything of it. Anyway, um, and, but we taught, you touched that material. And that's been the thing that's really it's the material that really drives me more than anything else. I just very, it, it, so when I go into my studio and I don't know what to do, you just, I touch the material and that's what leads me on. That's my, uh, you know, what, what guides me. And it's, I love, love feel. When I was teaching, I taught for 30 years, I was at Mainline Art Center and other places and, and also I, up at my Ava house on Cape Cod and I would te teach workshops up there with Claire Rogers. And we, um, you know, we just, it was so wonderful to, you know, I would begin every class with this uh, pinching thing, clo close your eyes and pinch and just feel the material and feel the clay in your fingers. And that's, and one thing that's interesting to me is that I, I have this book of, 10,000 years of ceramics or something. And um, the very first picture is a picture of a, of a uh, coil and it's got these fingerprints in it. And it's just like astounding to me. And it still gives me uh, goosebumps sort of to think that like, and that if you actually had that, you could put your fingers on this, the connection between it the, with the materials. So that's, it's the material, I guess I wouldn't say. I took a lot of art classes. I took a lot of drawing classes and it more. And I tried to be an artist. Couldn't, I couldn't draw, I couldn't do it, but um, I sure do love this material. So that keeps me going. I think that's it. That's lovely. I, I, I heard this from so many people. I don't understand why the idea that you're if you're not drawing or painting, that you're not an artist. I mean, well, there is trying that. to break that. <laughs> Let them break it because working with clay is just, as you're saying, it's a material that people have that holds the inspiration and the literal impression of people's creativity for thousands of years. So it's in fact better, better than a drawing. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and it's neat because you you're, you feel this material. Why not? You know, I don't really necessarily have any particular idea of what to do with it. Um, in, in drawing, you know, you look at the person's drawing over there. Oh my God, they're so much better than me. And um, God, they've got a, such a wonderful line. I could just never do it, but I don't know. But you can and make I, the clay. But the clay just, it wasn't making it. What I did was I, I followed the clay. Yeah. That's where it's harder to do that with a pencil. You know, I follow the clay and sort of where, where does it go? And then you kind of, so if you throw it, you take the slab and you throw it and um it's like whoa that's cool like look at that and then before you know and that's always how i begin that makes sense to you right <laughs> ceramic yeah, people, people are nodding yeah <laughs> um lovely okay we're gonna get back to some of those ideas but first let's ask catherine the same question i'm gonna move this over a little bit can you scoot towards that a little bit there you go Okay. Great. Okay. How and why did you make the brave decision to make your life in art? Well, it was complicated, but it was not complicated. My mother was an artist, and um, and I was crazy about my mother, and I wanted to do everything she did, and so I was always drawing, and I was always doing stuff when I grew up, and then. As I got older, I kept doing all that stuff, but I was interested in everything else also. So in school, you know, they give you these tests 
that interest aptitude tests. I was the only girl who came out should be an auto mechanic. And that should tell you something. <laughs> Everybody else is supposed to be in English or something. Um, but as I went to high school, we had to do electives. And the, my homeroom teacher was the art teacher at the high school. And he got upset that I wasn't taking electives in art. And I was taking journalism and biology and all these other things. And I said, but I can always do art, you know, and I was always doing art. And then after a couple of years of liberal arts college, I decided, okay, that may be the only thing I can do. And I transferred to an art school. And there was hard to get a ceramic class. And having grown up with a lot of Asian ceramics around me, and my mother always had a good collection, so um, I wanted to take ceramics. Well, my mother also worked at the college. And she, uh, I said, and she was good friends with Bill Daly. And oh, I didn't so, know that. And, um, How did she wish she well, it's a long story. Yeah, it's okay. Anyway, um, I said, I'm really disappointed. I want to take ceramics. And so when Bill walked by, my mother said, can't you squeeze her in something? And he went, oh, sure. So I finally got into ceramics because it was hard to get an elective in ceramics. What school were you in? So that's the College of Art. Yeah, I was going to ask, you weren't there, you weren't taking classes at the same time. You didn't no. know each other then. Uh, actually, we met each other there. Because when Kathy was taking a class, so at, she was the assistant. The I class was the career. assistant. Oh, okay. that was after I graduated, and um, and I knew when we, I came to the play studio. I was like, she looked at me, and I looked at her. I was like, we know each other, don't we? Right. <laughs> so yeah, that's what I just went into play. I, I signed up for industrial design as my major, and that summer I worked. Oh no, I signed up as in art education yeah. because my parents were pushing me to go into education because I could make a living. But that summer I worked in the admissions office and I just didn't want to be in art education. So I ripped up my registration and signed myself up to an, in another major industrial design and I forged my parents' signature. <laughs> and, and I, but after I took that, my second year when I took the electrical and ceramics, I decided, I was going to be a ceramic. I was going to be in ceramics. I wasn't going to be industrial design because that year I learned in industrial design you just do the drawings and the ideas, and there are other people who are mold makers who do all the hands-on work, and I wanted to do the hands-on work. That's what I liked. Even in science, I liked labs. I didn't like the studying, so um, I finally got myself into ceramics, and I've been there ever since. Yeah, and. Was Petrus your first teacher, Kathy, or was Bill Daly? No, Petrus was my first teacher. Bill Daly actually wasn't the teacher of mine um, at, at that stage. I did take a workshop with him for a week, which is one of the, I don't mean that. It, no, we're going it, back and forth. It's okay. yeah. um, well, and, and, and he, uh, when I up at, I spent my summers on Cape Cod, and there's an art center called the Truro Center for the Arts, the Castle Hill Center for the Arts. And um, he did a week long workshop. And um, it was unbelievably fabulous experience. And but the thing that was really interesting was it was during the week of 9/11. Uh, so where we were with it was a Tuesday. I remember we were with Bill in the class. We were making our hats or whatever it is that we were making to try. And we, we were uh, and then 9/11 happened. Somebody came in and it just so. Uh, and and we want we went over to some house to look at a TV and then everybody was like talking about it. He said, "Come on, I got to stop this. We got to make art. Art. This is mine. Art gives form to spirit. Is that correct? That's it. Sounds um, right. And we have to. And it was it was very important that that was our way of dealing. That was his way of dealing with it. It was a it was a special place to be. So that was my experience. Well, and the fact that he was. In World War II, a fighter pilot yeah. who got shot down during his first mission. I'm sure that that was an even more. Yeah, we didn't know that at the time, but he didn't, I think he may have shared that. I'm not sure. 
He did. It was, he was a fabulous teacher because when you went into his class, he was always excited. He was, wanted to do these projects and he wanted everyone to be excited about doing them. It didn't matter whether you did well or not, you know, it was the excitement. And I remember my first teaching class, I was teaching at Hartford Art School in Connecticut and I hadn't any experience teaching, but someone called me up and said, do you want this sabbatical? And I said, sure. Go with the, uh, yes. Go with the, uh, yep. So I was going into my first class and I was, how did Bill always, how was he always so upbeat? How is he so excited about everything? And I just kept thinking about it. I'm like, this is hard, you know, really much more difficult than you think. To be upbeat all the time? Yeah. 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 Well, it comes about some people better than others. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Having him as your first ceramic teacher must have been a really set a high standard. But my, when my kids were in uh, elementary school, they had a, he, Bill was doing this thing, his retirement was, to go around to schools and teach, um, like elementary schools, to teach his technique. Yeah. And so I had him come to the school where my kids were. And he, particularly fifth grade, that was, a, he thought that's when kids lose it. You gotta get them excited. You know, they start to look around and think they can't do it. But before then, they're just, you know, they, they're in, it's instinctive. So he did, he'd come in and he'd do this thing with, uh, making hats and, you know, the turn, making, turning them into making innies and outies and, and it was um, making it with paper or whatever, anyway. But it was it was wonderful experience, his wanting so desperately to, to get to the kids. That's where, you know, he really, he was a wonderful teacher. Yeah. What a good segue to the fact that Catherine, who had them as his, her first teacher then, Created the Playmobil program. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Thank you for that um, what, were we? Did you want to say anything else about your sort of early years before I? I'll show you some of your slides. No, that's fine. Okay. So, well, the one really very specifically, of course, as we'll do it. We'll go the other way this time. Um, because it is from your undergrad show. Really? Yeah, I did. A, it started out with teapots. Someone said, can you make me a teapot as an animal shape? So I did camels and I did giraffes and I did ducks. And then I started making these just forms that weren't functional or anything. Mm -hmm. And at the time it was 69. I graduated in spring of 70. And there was a lot of low fire glazing mm -hmm. going out on out in the West Coast. So I thought, well, I'm going to try some of that too. So I've made these with stoneware clay and I fired them, glazed the inside. And then when they came out, I used underglazes and I just went nuts with designs that had nothing to do with the surface. You know, I just played with them and that was a lot of fun. But in fact, these weren't in our senior show. They were supposed to be in our senior show. But the senior show came along right around the time of bombing of Cambodia. Oh. And you have to remember how political things were in college then. And so the ceramic artists entered a statement, a quote from somebody about something political, I can't remember now, and did not show our work. In response to the yeah, bombing. Wow. Yeah, a sort of a protest. Well, he was pissed. And I said, What's, don't you agree with it? He said, well, yeah, but I want you guys to show your work too. Yeah. So it didn't quite make it to the senior show. Well, it's on view now at the play studio. <laughs> yes. Did it ever, does that mean it's never been shown before? No, exhibition? it actually hasn't been shown. Wow. I, I had about eight of these different things. I had a giraffe and a couple of camels and a couple of ducks still left. But when I was moving from my house to a two, one bedroom apartment, I started giving them away. So they're dispersed. But around the country yeah other people can yeah enjoy them i mean it's really a, i love that you said stuff happening on the west coast because at that time there was a very west coast east coast ceramics yeah thing happening and it was sort of like bill daly and against uh bob arneson right, right, right. right and the, to use the bright colors and um slow fire was interesting did was it something did you talk about it at the time that you were taking the inspiration from the West Coast? Yeah, yeah. 
that was where I got, nobody in school was doing bright low fire colors. We were all doing brown <laughs> and soft lace, you know. I mean, it's actually, it looks more like it's from the late 70s or early 80s, that sort of surface decoration, ornament and decoration movement that was happening. So and it that you were ahead of your time. Yeah, mm -hmm. that rock, oh, just like Peter Bogus's rocking pot. You were just right there. I love it, cutting edge. Um, so then, well, then and you spent time being a production potter. 15 years. And, um, and these are beautiful, but they're so thin. And I had light. a list of about 20 items that I made, you know, mugs were the number one. You know, like one year I just sat and counted up how many mugs I made for wholesale. Mm. And um, it was over 400. Oh my God. Oh, and like, so you can't really stay in that by yourself for too long. You know, most of the people I know who do production work, they're not a single artist. They're a couple or they have some um, help. Help, yeah. And, um, associates come in, you know, interns and stuff. But I never got around to that. You know, it was sort of like, I got to get myself to work. I'm not sure if I can get someone else to work. So I just did that for a while and then I. I was still doing when I came to the play studio, mm -hmm. but I gave up shortly afterwards. Um, I supported myself for a while. Yeah, 15 years. And a mouth. Impressive. Mm -hmm. um, and then you started, tell us about That's that annoying. when you- I said black dot on your oh. screen. There you go. Thank you. So tell us about how you came to be at the play studio. Thanks, John. Well, um, after I left Hartford, I moved over to studio in Northeastern Pennsylvania in this really small town. And I rented a house for $50 and it was big enough for a studio and, and I switched to Electrify. And then from there, I moved down and- Were you up by yourself? Yeah. And then I, I was working with a lot of terracotta then. And then I moved down to share a studio with a friend in North Carolina and near, near Penland. Um, and then after that, I decided, you know, I'm just not really a country person. <laughs> I, I miss the city. Don't like the book. No. <laughs> when I was in Northeastern Pennsylvania, you know, the excitement was if a cow broke out of the pasture and then it broke, it was like nothing going on out there. Sometimes I didn't go out for days. Um, but so in North Carolina, I realized it wasn't just being alone because then I, there were some people around, but I helped her build her house and her studio. And I decided I'm gonna go move back to the city. So I tried to try to find some place to work. And the play studio was one of the few places that I, you could go as a potter. How did you hear about it? I'm I mean, wait, that was early. I mean, early yeah. Early yeah, it was in the first building. Um, I think I was there for just over a year. So, and you were only there for five years. You're right. In that building. So, I think I stopped into um, what's the other place you used to? Forestry Pottery. Forestry Pottery. And asked if they knew of any places. And, and uh, he told me the name. And so I got information and applied. And I got in. And so that was fortunate. That there I were a lot more that. potters then. I remember that. So they were around this big table, but there you were. Interesting. I don't remember a lot of these days, but I remember that. <laughs> you remember, Are you I, doing the slide? Were you looking at the slide? No, there I don't think we had camera. We were just, she was there first. Okay. Yeah, and we had spaces right next to each other, and we've been next to each other since. Yes. Remember. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so that's how I came to the play studio. And after I was there a while, I decided it was hard doing production work in the city. And I decided to do porcelain. I like the white surface, but in my production work, it was very simple, it was simple forms and a couple of glazes on each piece with overlaps that gave me at least a third color or some variations. So when I got to the porcelain, I was like, okay, I have to do something on this. So I remember reading from an art book years ago, you should start out with what you know, 
And I thought, well, I know a lot about food. So, so I decided to do fruits and vegetables. And this is one of the early ones. Mediterranean diet. Yeah, vegetables, <laughs> soup to read. Yeah, well, I hope everyone can come and see it in the gallery. Just, I mean, it's nice on the screen, but it's even more beautiful. And the color, beautiful. is that a salad? Is there yeah. A salad? The shame, the color. And the, uh, yeah, and the carving holds the glaze in different ways, so it just makes it really. Yeah, I've been carving sort of ever subtle. since. Yeah. Great. And there's a potato. I like Carrots, potatoes. Those like are that. peaches. These are peaches. And this is from maybe 10 years. That's from, yeah, that's about 10 years later. And, and that's when I was, Kathy and I were sharing a studio in South Philadelphia. Mm. And, and electric. And we were firing electric then. Because we had left the glacier. That yeah. was a big deal. Yeah, you talk about I tested all my glazes, the gas glazes in the electric film before I left. And the ones that looked okay in terms of the firing and their surface and stuff, I picked those and then tested them for colors and stuff afterwards when I got to the electric film. Mm -hmm. But this is also my cellar with the iron out and um, copper in it, in electric film. Wow. Beautiful color. And then this one's the most recent one. Yes. Um, I started doing a bunch of teapots. Everybody kept, after I was in the craft show the first time, I had several teapots in there and they got all sold out and everybody wanted a teapot. So I made a bunch. But before that, I was working on just orbs that were carved and I had that green glaze inside mm -hmm. that sold on birth and it's high copper. I've since lowered the percentage of copper, but so when I made one of the orbs and there was a really thin spot, it was just thrown and stretched. It wasn't carved. I was like, what is all this brown stuff when it came out of the kiln? And then I realized it was the inside glaze bleeding through porcelain and being absorbed by the outside glaze. Um, so then when I started carving, I made particular thin where I was carving and wanted shadows. And it worked as a good technique and people kept saying, did you put all that coloring in there? What you use? And I said, no, it's just glaze. Hmm. So it was one of those, one of the few really wonderful surprises I got out of the kiln. When you're in production pottery, surprises are really bad. <laughs> yeah. But when you're making one of a kind pieces, they can be great. <laughs> and this one was great. And so I made a lot of teapots and then suddenly the, the vogue passed. And so I had a lot of teapots left. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, well, maybe, maybe they're back. People are drinking fancy tea. Okay, thank you. We're gonna switch to Kathy and then we'll talk more about early clay studio memories. Um, this I think is the earliest piece of yours that's in the exhibition, which I think is important. And it's hard, it's hard to see in the picture, but there's, um, there's mark making, there's an arrow right here. There's some other, um, stitch lines, stitch lines that are continue to be present in your work. I was, I went to Finland and with Three other people, Claire and Cap, and Claire and Amy, and Jill. Jill, Jill, right, that right. And the four of us went down to Penland, and um, the teacher was Robert Turner. So one of the things, so there's that sort of like I don't know, he would make these forms, and he'd um, and and he look at this piece. I mean, we were doing all sorts of crazy things, like lying on floors, being rivers. I don't know. <laughs> guy was like some little out there, right? right? He was really, and um, he he um, he'd look, and I, I said, "How do you?" He stared at his piece for the longest time, and then he he'd go, and then you'd say, "I'd say, well, what, why are you putting it there, or what is it?" He said, "I do what the clay asks." Okay. So he's following the play too, right? I mean, he's just like, that's a lot. And um, so I was like, I don't know. Anyway, that was a piece from that time of Bob Turner. It was wonderful. 
workshop. Ken was a terrific place to be. Um, so that reinforced your instinct that the clay was the thing that you were going right, to right, follow. Right, right, right. He wasn't a, he wasn't a textural, you know, but it was just, the stuff was very subtle. Like, quiet, I guess you'd say. Mm -hmm. um, amazing man. This is uh, done in, um, I guess I did it in Cape Cod. Um, slab platter. I've always worked in porcelain once I've, I've always worked in porcelain, but, um, and these large platters, I did them, I didn't glaze them um, very hard to make, to fire them, make them fall. They're thin and, um, Anyway, so this was done. Uh, one of the things that Claire and I did when we did our workshop up in the Cape was to do alternative firing, to try to do something that we couldn't do in the city. And um, so we had a garbage can kiln and we did sagger firing, sawdust firing, uh, the houses open behind me and so that you can have a kill and, and there were no houses looking at us. And so I've gotten away with it for a while. I haven't. And um, this was done with uh, sawdust. So you put sawdust on the piece and, um, and then you hit it with a torch. Sawdust burns, leaves marks. You Then you start looking at other things. You, you do magazines or human hair, which is weird. I'd go into the hair to get my hair cut. Make Sweep up the hair from the floor. Hair. So I'd go in again on the girl and say, do you need any more hair? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, and that's, uh, and then it's hard to see, you can't see it on here, but this has a lot of these little stitch marks. And what, on the cave, one of the things I would do, I, I've always had dogs, but, and so I'd walk on the beach with a dog every morning for, and I very much pay attention to the marks that were on the beach by not the dog, but mainly uh, those birds, little stitch marks, marks that would, these dunes are really high and little pieces would fall down. They'd leave these little trails. I just love that stuff. Uh, so it was very much like looking at clay too. I mean, you're looking at the mud, you're looking at the dunes, you're looking at the, you know, it's nothing rocket science by any means, but it's just, you know, whatever it is that just moves you. And I've, I've, one of the things I always would say to students is, you know, you, you walk down, it doesn't really matter uh, where you are really, but you tend to find yourself looking at the same kind of thing, whether you're in the woods or in the, in the ocean or whatever. So that's, that's what I do. And then I would make those marks on pieces. And this was, uh, referenced in my mind, um, one of the areas. Okay, we'll, we'll save our questions for the end. We actually, it took so long, we decided to keep talking. So we were just talking about um, why the rules were made in the early days, because Kathy said <laughs> people would uh, not clean off their kiln shelves. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know, you know, that kind of stuff, just whatever it is. Really. When you're in a group, I mean, I'm sure the same things here. Like if you, if yeah. you're if you're the associate, you know, those beautiful tables, and if you get up and leave and just leave your stuff there, which... no, everybody follows all the rules perfectly. <laughs> there you go. That you know of. Anyway, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'm not one to talk because I'm pre I'm, I'm my studio is in front of a messy. But it's your own studio, though. So <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. Everyone does a great job. Um, everyone makes mistakes, but everyone does a great job. So it just it's it it was an interesting time trying to make. Mm -hmm. I the other thing one of the other memories I have is um, when the women. This is like the second year we are in uh, in the building, and the women from the craft show. The craft show. Mm -hmm. So they started a year after, I guess, the Play Studio started. That's, they they started there. in seventy six, and they came and I'll never forget that they walked in there like four of them. And they're all wearing black. This is why before black was like the thing to wear. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all wearing black. And they're walking through this, and you're kind of going, oh my God. 
they're gonna they're get, gonna get totally, totally fit. They, totally. walk, they walk out in gray. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> and people, no, they were not. They wanted to see what it was about. Yeah. I mean, they were wanted to, they'd heard we were there, I guess. I think they wanted to, I don't know if they knew anybody, maybe it was Jill or who the connection was, or but they were doing like a little tour of art stu artist studios and so anyway, it was interesting. So you wrote, you wrote the, you all wrote the application for the nonprofit, and then yeah, that's because I guess somebody, you know, if we need Linda. a lawyer, I probably. Linda that. started that up. No, then the second that, one was a tax exempt. We had law, have to have lawyers. We had lawyers for that, as well. whether it was Stewart or Sheldon or something. Um, second Sheldon's. Anyway, uh, and that's a very hard thing to get. That's exempt. Yeah, I think it's very hard to get. So we must have had very good lawyers. <laughs> Great. Pro bono good lawyers. Pro bono good lawyers. Yeah. Yeah. That's, <laughs> uh, and so we go to this whole trouble and we get it. And then I, th I think I remember writing, I have no idea even how I knew how to do it. But, um, and then, uh, when we went to Arch Street and we had a bigger group of people in the school, when the idea was we've got the school and it's going to be nonprofit and, and this is great, you know, we're going to, and it's going to help us. And, um, and then there's the fire and everybody goes, I'm not in this for uh, silver. You know, they, people didn't want to do. The, the work, the work involved that they didn't want. They, all they, all, everybody just wanted to have a place to work, and it wasn't about a school, and it wasn't about nonprofit and doing good and helping out. So it was none of that. Wanted so, a place to work, so they everybody sort of left. Do you remember that? Yeah, a lot of people left. A lot of people. Hmm. I think you told me that then that there was a lot of kitchen table. Kitchen well, then, table. then, then I saw everybody left, and then about a, a, a good amount of people, and then Catherine and I. Primarily. Friends to the end sat at my kitchen table and we just tried to figure for months, it seemed to me. I don't know. Looking for buildings. Trying to figure out what to do. Well, okay, so let's talk about that in a minute. But Catherine, can you talk a little bit about when you first, I mean, you did already a bit, but you know, Kathy said she remembers the meeting when you were there to apply. Do you remember that? Do you remember sitting at the table sort of? No. <laughs> I, I thought it, answer. <laughs> my memory is uh, that I sort of sent in slides and I was approved. And so then the first day I came in, there were all these people I didn't know. Oh, anymore. well, that's probably what I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was a little nerve wracking. You know, there were all these people looking at you, like evaluating you. you know? <laughs> but um, I settled right in. Yeah, it felt it felt like a good fit for all of you clearly yeah yeah, yeah was, i did yeah. certainly did for me mm -hmm. and um, there were people on the second floor on the first floor and a couple in the basement because it was a lot cheaper so some people had to yeah. in the basement was where, where the, the rock of kiln was and it's where the yeah. gas kiln was and then when and we the had, clay mixer yeah I, I don't even remember the clay mixer because i was teaching a class at pca and uh, i mixed my clay over there it was a lot cleaner. Yeah. With above ground, there was like the long tradition for clay studio people that use the facility that PCA. Yeah. With. Yeah, exactly. Still well, happening. Bill, Bill came to the clay studio to ask me if I wanted to teach. Oh, okay. And somebody had left and they needed to fill in. Oh, great. And, and, uh, and I, when, did it, when did it start that you would have? sort of other people coming to see, I know you had holiday sales in the beginning. Yeah. When do you feel like it kind of turned more into a shop or a gallery? That was on Second Street. We didn't really have a shop or a gallery on Arch Street. Mm -hmm. It was the first floor we were with there. the elevators. And um, we had the school and the artist spaces. And then on Second Street, the artists were upstairs. And there was a very small space that used 
decided to use as a gallery. And then there was a little space right when you ran around the corner to go upstairs, and they put shelves there. And that was our first shop. Oh, oh. in the stairway. <laughs> yeah. No, as you face, as you came oh. down, and face it was that wall. Got it. And um, that was the first time we had a gallery. Mm. Oh well, I don't know if I told this before. This is I'm jumping here, but but um, you know that fire, the fire that was really one of those huge hunts, you know, it was a, and yes, Kevin and I spent a long time trying to talk about what, what we were gonna do, but when the fire happened and um, there was, this is where Bert Horowitz came in. I mean, he was really important. I mean, he he was a insurance adjuster, right? Is that what Public yeah. insurance and, um, and and he just he decided to take us under his wing. I mean, he just he felt sorry for us. We were Catherine said he liked women with red hair, or maybe his wife had red hair. <laughs> and he just that's, it. that's why the place you didn't really exist. And you he, <laughs> red hair too. Yeah, I did. <laughs> anyway, he he uh, and he was really important. Um, and he well, you know, whatever. It turns out we didn't really have much insurance, and so we their bit, they got a fee and the fee was pretty small because they got half the percentage of what we got, but we got such a little amount of money that it hardly made it worthwhile. So he sort of forgave that. Oh, my, my wife loves, she's a photographer. She loves it hard. And, and I don't know, he just decided to, to take us under his wing. And it, it was just wonderful. And, and I, the story, and I may have told this before because it's a great story, but when you look, walked into the Art Street building and you, uh, it was four stories high and the stairway went straight up the side. It didn't do one of these things, you know, and goes right up. So if you open the door down at the sidewalk and you stood at the very top, you could talk to the person because it was that just so he he um he comes in and 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 um we were trying to we we're cleaning up this building. I mean, because it's Stuff well, got thrown all over the place with we the trying, water, finding stuff to do and we're trying to claim things to figure out what to do. So he, so he comes. When I was in February or Jan, March or something, and, and he, he stands at the bottom in his camel hair coat, and he yells up, you know, Kathy, Kathy, what's? And I'm, I stand up at the top, and he goes, "You haven't." He's been in Florida for three weeks or something. You haven't called. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, everybody else has called me wanting their money. You haven't called. And I said, was I supposed to call? I didn't know. <laughs> well, I didn't know how to play the game. I don't know. It was just really funny. And he's like, going, come on. You're like, what's, he's all ready to help us out. And we were, it was really funny. You didn't call. He um, walked us through the whole procedure. Yeah. How to do this. Uh, yeah, he was just, and then, and then he brought all his friends in. And so, then one of the things is we needed to get a real life board of directors and how do you do that? Well, because the council on the arts said you have to have a real life board. You, you, you've got now you're tax exempt. You can't take this measly amount of money. You can't just give it away. You have to do something with it because you're tax exempt. So we go, what? And they said, well, you know, hire an executive director for $6,000 and let their job be to raise them, raise their salary. To raise enough money to pay, to pay themselves it was sort of the way it was. It was a learning experience, not another right. learning experience. And uh, so then Bert comes in and he brings he's he's on the board. We did board of directors, and Stuart was on the board, and then he was uh, Ken was on the board. All these men, obviously, it was just except for Dina. And then we had an executive director, Dean Levy, and then uh, I don't know. It just was a crazy, crazy time. We didn't know. And, uh, and we had no money. And Bert, you know, we're looking at the the, the the board mates and these guys are looking at the numbers and it's just awful. And, um, and, and, and Stuart says, well, I think we'll just age these payables. Age the payables. What, and Bert says, what, the heck does that what does that mean? Does that mean just not pay them? <laughs> <laughs> then, yeah, that just is that. Well, it was just like really, I don't know. It was just, it was a real learning experience. And Kim was involved in all that stuff too. So. And and Catherine, you so you were both sort of work working 
trying to make sure everything kept going and you yeah. know the person but you were both I think both of us probably had more free time than other people and so we get together and talked about yep. it a lot yeah, 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 yeah. the things that had to be accomplished and we had uh, needed to find a building and um we were looking at a lot of different places, but a lot of people had left by then, so it wasn't as many people to manage. Yeah, yeah, if you were serious about making your, you know, I mean, this because what happened for me was the Clay Studio became a community. It's just, it was what mine, and it still is, I guess, to a large extent. Mm -hmm. um, this is became a community, and and. Um, and although I stepped back over the years in different ways, I mean, I've always been. Anyway. Yeah, that's important. I'm very grateful. Thank you. Uh, um, I So we don't have a lot of time since we're already over because we missed a little bit of time there, but I can't leave without asking about the Claymobile. And can you talk a little bit about when you just said, okay, fine, we'll come. You can't come to us, we'll go to you. Yeah, I was. Yeah. There were a lot, at that point, there were a lot of, the Greater Philadelphia Cultural Alliance will put together a lot of meetings with nonprofits, the directors and then the education programming and stuff. So we're, um, Jimmy didn't have time to go. He was too busy with the fundraising and, and the galleries and stuff. So he sent me and it was a great learning experience. And we had, uh, The first thing was we had to do a publicity thing and you had a choice of three or four different things. And I picked having a piece of public service announcement. Oh, PSA. On TV. Yeah, on TV. So oh. um, we had that. Did you do a commercial? Yeah, and it was free. And, um, and then the, one of our board directors was uh, at Fox News at that time, he was head. And so apparently it was on some kind of tape and then we had to put it to something else that could we could shop around. And every time some TV show or station aired it in the middle of the night or at the crack of dawn, we'd get a lot of calls. So I knew they must have run it. <laughs> and other people did combinations with checks or credit cards or other things and weren't nearly as uh, successful. So I said, TV is the way to go. Mm -hmm. And the other thing we did there was all these education directors met and they talked about their education program. And I was having no luck getting kids to come to Saturday classes. Mm -hmm. So um, there were not a lot of kids in the neighborhood. You know, there was was no all was all city considered a dangerous neighborhood? No, it was that they were all businesses and uh, young yeah, people. working people and they yeah, didn't have children. Like that. Yeah, yeah, so it's not like Fleischer where they, the students in the neighborhood come and apply. So I decided, well, we just have to go out. And then I just was thinking about it one day and I remember my nieces and nephews toys, the Playmobile and I went, we can do a Playmobile. Oh, play and that's where really? it came from, just like that. That's and the board was really excited and we got a, Jimmy was great about raising money and the only thing that was that we avoided which was really a relief the board had a lot of ideas and one of them was to put a teacup on top big teacup on top of the van and drive around and I was like I don't think we could do that <laughs> thank god they I mean since they, they wanted another flight I don't know what they want to made of, but they wanted like this big cup and saucer on the top of the van. It was just amazing. So sometimes board input, board input is really great. And other times it's really crazy. Right. You have well, to pick and choose. Brainstorming like any other year, yeah. right? Yeah, great. but that's how it started. And the first year we didn't have the money. Jimmy said I could spend X amount of money and I did a program that I publicized at the annual Teach, art teachers meeting at the um, Board of Education. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm gonna run this program. If you can bring your students to the Clay Studio and then pay for that and come and then afterwards pick up the pieces, we can give them a tour of the studio and they can each make a project. So we did that and that's how I learned how to deal with children. 
and what children could do and what you could do with children and what could happen and what's involved. So we did a year of that. And I'm glad we did because I really needed that to go out. And the first year I went out with every Glenmobile to analyze the sites, just the first uh, time. And that was important. But it was really successful program and it still is. It still is. But the thing that makes it as successful as it is now is that everybody who works on it is excited about it. And so they all have suggestions and ideas to improve it. And they're all involved. So it's nowhere near what, what we started. But everybody's contributed so much that that's why it keeps being excited because everybody's still excited about it, even though I'm long gone. And the first van has been dead for years. <laughs> that we have to do to be the play design. Yes. Graphic. Yeah. Yeah. The Raymond Actually, Raymond. it was so successful. I said to Jimmy in this first year, I said, you've got to stop writing grants. I can't go to all these places. <laughs> Being up with demand is yeah. there. It's still, still an issue, which a good issue, but still an issue. Um, does anyone have questions? I know we're so long over it. So if anyone's still with us, we appreciate it. Um, if we don't have questions now, you're welcome to send them along and I'll share them with Kathy and Catherine. But I think I think Billy got them. off. Yeah, I guess. Oh, I'm right here. Can yeah. you hear me? Have a question, Millie? Can you hear me? I didn't have a question. I <clears throat> I've just been thinking about how something Kathy said that was um was so clear and wonderful about she touches the material and follows the material. Is that what you said, Kathy? Yes. <laughs> yes. And it reminded me of something Ruth Bacon, who lived across the street from you, who was an artist in her life in many ways. And she said, it's in the doing that the idea comes. And, and, and you demonstrated that when you said what you said. And I, and I loved it. I forgot on you. Yeah, it's in the doing. But yeah. Uh huh. Thank you. That's lovely. Uh, okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for bearing with us. Uh, we are going to figure out how to stitch those two things together. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for being guests on Playing Conversations. Yeah, thank you. For again. Us. <laughs> Thanks to both of you. It was just wonderful. Thanks for everybody for coming. It was great. Come see the exhibition. It's there until the 31st, which is Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> what? Easter yeah. Sunday? Oh. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody.